Here, let me start this. If you'd like to uh, order a, a lily in somebody's honor or memory, uh, you can still order from next week too, but I'm going to start buying them this week if you'd like to sign up. I'm going to talk to you this morning about prayer. Prayer. Um, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And he gave this example. He said, when you pray, pray after this manner. Now we've taken that to be a literal example and it's a wonderful prayer for us to say and use. Um, and it's a wonderful format, but it is not, should not be the only prayer that we pray every week. In fact, I think sometimes we have the connotation that in order to pray, we have to get down on our hands and knees, close our eyes, fold our hands, and uh, let me tell you, there have been several times when I'm driving my car and I need to pray and ask the Lord for help and I'm better off not closing my eyes. <laughs> and then I rely on the scripture where Paul said, watch and pray, watch and pray. Uh, prayer is meant to be a, a powerful asset in our lives and in fact Paul said this in uh, uh, Thessalonians pray without ceasing pray without stopping um, and God has done some awesome things in our lives and it's, it is God's plan um, for us to communicate with him in prayer and I think that would be a better word sometimes um, then the word prayer by itself is communicate with the Lord. The word communication, well, let me ask it this way as a question. Do you think the word communication involves a one-way sharing of information or a two-way sharing of information? Really should be both, shouldn't it? And so our prayers are really communication, or I like the word conversations with the Lord, conversations with the Lord. Um, because God is concerned about every aspect of our life. Um, Psalms, David said, Lord, you know all of my ways when I'm standing up, when I'm sitting down, when I'm walking, when I'm running, when I'm driving the car. Lord, you know all of my ways. And I'm inclined to believe God has a reporting system to keep track of that, and they're called angels. And every one of you have at least one angel, and I'm inclined to think several, watching over you, traveling with you, and I believe they communicate, keep track, and, and bear record with the Lord about all that we're saying and doing all day long. God knows what we're doing. Um, we find that difficult to imagine in our minds because how many of us struggle to pat your head and rub your stomach or uh, to walk and chew gum or to do two things at the same time? As the older we get, the more difficult that is to focus on one thing. Amen. <laughs> but I believe God plans for us to pray without ceasing to carry on because he's concerned about all of the aspects. In fact, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge, consult, look to him, and he will direct your path. So <clears throat> stay in constant communication with the Lord. Um, for example, almost all of us carry cell phones now. Um, so how many hours a day should you keep your cell phone turned on? Wouldn't 24 hours a day be a good thing? Especially with my dad's possibly calling me in the middle of the night for an emergency. I want to be able to receive that call, acknowledge, and, and respond. And so we have that channel of communion with the Lord through the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day. We can communicate with him continuously, and I believe that's God's plan for us to do it rather than one big ch chunk of time. Here, I, I thought of an example. Becky, <clears throat> would you rather Steve would give you a 21-minute hug on Sunday mornings and tell you how much he loves you, or would it 
be better to have him spend one minute every morning, every noon, and every night. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wouldn't a little bit be better every day than one big chunk? Absolutely. Yeah. See, and why would it be any different in our relationship with the Lord? Rather than just this hour on Sunday mornings or a certain time in your morning devotion or prayer, rather than just one chunk, <clears throat> it seems to me God's desire is to have us be in constant communion and fellowship with Him. And so this is a lesson I taught years ago, and... I really felt a bit repeating in this year with COVID and all these things going on in the country and, and so many personal problems in people's lives uh, for us to be in constant communion with the Lord. So I made this list some time ago and I find myself reminded to thank the Lord for little things all throughout the day in response to circumstances in my life. I put together a list of things that we do every day, and I'd like you to take this list that I printed and either uh, put it up on your refrigerator with your grandkids' picture, or uh, on the mirror in your bedroom and, and, and look at this. Um, here's some simple reminders I'm gonna to touch on as many as I can this morning. When I awaken in the morning, to say, Lord, I thank you for opening my eyes. Now, that in itself would be a good prayer. Just, Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. But as you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, thank you for opening my eyes to see the light of the glorious gospel. Because the majority of the world is walking in darkness. Spiritual darkness. They don't see Jesus as the Son of God. They don't see Jesus as the Savior of the world dying on the cross. They don't see their need for a Savior. I remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, the great earthquake in San Francisco during the World Series. Does anybody remember that? And they broke away from the World Series because stuff was going on all over the city. And one, I think, was the Golden Gate Bridge. And here's this bridge flopping around. And there are cars on it trying to hurry up and get across the bridge. And they showed him driving to hurry to get off the bridge, not realizing that there was a section in the middle of the bridge that had collapsed. And they showed cars, plop, plop, because they didn't see the danger that was ahead. And they were just continuing down that same path. And the majority of people in the world are in that same condition. Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. And he's talking about those who are spiritually blind. We have that even in our churches. Those that are preaching a social gospel and not challenging people that we are sinners who need a savior and we need to have our sins forgiven. And there has to be a warning that goes out, number one, from a, lead, a spiritual leader. And then number two, <clears throat> people have to have their eyes opened to see that signal, to see the danger. The world is headed for disaster and danger and either they don't have somebody telling them and warning them or Jesus said the God of this world has blinded their eyes and they don't see their need for a savior. But Jesus told the disciples, blessed are your eyes because they see. Each one of you sitting here today are some of, among some of the most amazingly privileged people in the world. Yes, because we were born in America. Yes, we were born in a nation where the gospel is preached. But primarily, your greatest blessing is that God has opened your eyes to see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Or you'd be the one driving off the bridge into the deep. Blessed are your eyes. In fact, that's how we need to pray for family, for friends. Ephesians. Paul said, pray that the eyes of their understanding will be opened so that they can see the light of this glorious gospel. Satan has blinded their eyes. They can't see. Tom, come up here. Let me use you for an example again. 
Now, one scripture, Jesus said, they have willingly blinded their eyes. Sometimes people know better, but, you know, it's like your, your kids sometimes when you're telling them something, and it's, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. You know, they deliberately don't. Stand over here just a little bit. Put your hands over your eyes. Okay? So, now tell me how many fingers do you see raised up? None. So, you are willingly blinded, or Satan has blinded your eyes. Billy, you come up here, you be the Holy Spirit. You're the Holy Spirit, so I'm gonna say, Lord, send the Holy Spirit to open Tom's eyes. So now you're the Holy Spirit, you come up beside him and open his eyes. Take the blinders off. You may see. How many fingers do you see now? Three. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. They don't see. And only the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can remove the blinders. Oh, now I see. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Every morning when you wake up, Lord, I thank you that you've opened my eyes to see. Start off your day. It's easy when you wake up. Number two, how many of you woke up this morning breathing? You have to have the oxygen to breathe. So one of the important things when a child is born, we celebrate when he takes his, he or she takes their first breath. Or they used to spank them. I don't think they do that anymore, but the idea was to get them to <laughs> cry or make a sound or well, because that first breath is important. And as important as that first breath is, how important is the second breath, or the third one, or the one thousandth one, or the ten millionth one, or how important is your next breath, Vicki? Pretty important, Pretty important isn't it? Yeah. God's plan is for us to breathe. Spiritually, the truth of that is for us to breathe the Holy Spirit in, and then to breathe and continually walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Breathing is important, not only for the physical body, but for your spirit. So every time you take a breath, well, that'd be all day long, wouldn't it? Say, Lord, I thank you for, whenever you think of it, say, Lord, thank you for opening my eyes uh, to see the light of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the breath of God that flows in me. And here's the practical example of that. When did Adam become a living, eternal spirit being? When God breathed. breathed into him the spirit of life. You know when the disciples were born again? <clears throat> Nobody's born again in the Old Testament. When were the disciples born again? I'll give you a hint, they're in the upper room. Jesus has died, come back from the dead. He appears in the midst of them, and it says he blank on them and said receive the Holy Spirit what's the word fill in the blank breathe. breathe he breathed on them when I was a kid growing up we sang a song in church let him breathe on me let him breathe on me let the breath of God now breathe on me see because that's meant to be a daily continual thing you know what they tell you that when somebody gets really excited, hyperventilated, you know what they tell you? Breathe in, take deep breaths. I'd like to tell a lot of Christians do that. Sometimes I've tell myself, slow down, take a deep breath, relax. We do that with the Holy Spirit. Number three, how many of you got dressed this morning? <laughs> Yeah, everybody. Yeah, that's a good thing. Thank you for that. Um, as you get dressed, say, "Lord, I thank you. I'm thankful for these clothes. I'm thankful for this suit." But you know, the morning wear that I'm looking forward to wear more than anything else when I get to heaven, and we're gonna put on a robe of righteousness, Jerry. A robe of righteousness. You know, I think and. It doesn't literally say that in Genesis, but I get that indication from other scriptures that Adam and Eve were not literally naked in the Garden of Eden until after they sinned. 
and it says then they realized they were naked. So I'm inclined to believe they were not naked before. But you know what I think they were wearing before they sinned? A robe of righteousness. The glory of God clothed them. Because that's what we're going to have when we get to heaven. And before Adam and Eve sinned, they had that as they walked with God in the garden. I believe they were clothed with the glory of God. But when they sinned, they lost the glory. In fact, there are several indications of that in Scripture. Jesus even prayed that, Father, restore unto me the glory that I had with you since the beginning. And then Paul said, Christ in us is our hope of glory. I believe there's a longing and desire and there's reason for us to believe that we are going to again be clothed with the righteousness and the glory of God. That will be our robe. You know, when we see pictures of Jesus in the Bible, uh, he's, especially in his resurrected body, he's shining. Remember what, when Moses came down from the mountain after he had this confrontation in the presence of God Almighty, he came down, and what was there about his appearance in his face that was so unusual? He glowed. He shined because the glory of God was reflected in him, through him, on him. It changed him. Does anybody remember those little plastic crosses or figurines you used to have when we were kids and you put them up next to a light bulb and you let them absorb the heat and light from that light bulb and then you could shut off all the lights especially at night and it would glow because it absorbed some of that energy from the light bulb and I believe that's what we're going to have when we're in heaven this robe of righteousness we're going to glow and share and have the glory of God so when you get dressed in the morning, say, Lord, I thank you for that promise. You know, another thing, I said this a couple years ago, and I didn't incorporate it here, but I do believe we ought to be praying more as believers in, in these last days. But even more than that, or in addition to that, I believe we need to be talking to the devil a whole lot more. Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. You resist the devil, Paul said. You resist the devil, he will flee from you. Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. He spoke to the devil. And I believe there's times in our lives. So as, as appropriate it is for us to pray to God, I think it's appropriate for us to pray. For, so when you get up in the morning, thank you, Lord, for opening my eyes to see the light of the gospel. Satan, you're a liar. And the Holy Spirit has come to guide me into truth. And you will not cloud my mind or my thinking. Speak to the devil. Lord, I thank you for breathing in the Holy Spirit. Satan, you're a liar. The Spirit of God is in me and on me. And I'm walking, breathing, communing, fellowshipping with him. Satan, I'm going to wear a robe of righteousness. You're saying I'm not worthy? Yes, I am. Jesus Christ has made me worthy. So at the same time we're talking to God, I believe you incorporate and talk to the devil at the same time as well. I got a bunch of these things and you can go through them. But how many of you washed your face or your hands this morning? Yeah, every day. In fact, Dr. Fauci is saying we ought to, how many times a day, Lynn, do you wash your hands at school? You know, over and over and over and over again. Um, the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. Not just that one time. Butch, do you know what year you were saved or came to serve the Lord? Are you wearing the same clothes now you did then? No. No. So you've dirtied a lot of clothes in the last 60-some uh, years, huh? We all do that. It says, if we say we don't sin, we lie. Even after we've been born again, received the Spirit of God, yes, we sin. We still have remnants of the old selfish nature, and, and we say and do things. But the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Not just 1953, but... And not just once a year like Israel used to have, every day. Or are there some days you pray more than once a day to forgive your sin, Butch? Oh, yeah. yeah, me too. As necessary. I mean, how many of you when your kids got muddy or dirty said, all right, you made the mess, 
You can just wear them for the rest of the day. I'm not going to clean you up more than once a day. If we were willing to clean up the messes of our kids over and over again, or change diapers, man, how many diapers do you change in that first 12 months? It's, it's a bunch. But we do it gladly, cheerfully, because we love them and we want to see them grow and mature and, and grow in life. And how much more would the Heavenly Father? So he washes us over and over again. So when, when you're washing your face and your hands, thank you, Lord, for cleansing me from all my sin. Um, combed your hair. Uh, we comb our hair, and you know what's underneath the hair or the scalp? Our brain, pretty important part of our lives. And so when you're combing your hair, you can say, Lord, I thank you that I have my right mind. I mean, how many of you are forgetting more things every year? I mean, sometimes we forget what we forgot. But <laughs> the mind tends to lose some of its connections, but we are to be ever increasing in our knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Ever growing, ever maturing. And learn. So when you comb your head, you can say, Lord, thank you for revealing your truth. Thank you, Lord, for a mind that hears and receives the things of God. Um, you brush your teeth. When you're brushing your teeth in the morning, you know, one of the most important things to keep clean and under control in the life of a believer is your mouth. Mouth. James said your mouth is like a, a tiny rudder. For example, does anybody know how big the rudder was on the Titanic? Here's this huge big ship, over a thousand feet long. You know how big the rudder was that steered it unsuccessfully away from the iceberg? It didn't turn fast enough, but the rudder on that big ship was less than 20 feet and it's steering this great big boat across the ocean. Or, how many of you remember the famous line from um, Smokey the Bear? Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Because one little match, one little cigarette, one little fire can burn thousands of acres. And Paul, James used that analogy, he said, look at the huge big fire that one little tongue can put aflame. How many of you remember a song from Sunday school, if you went to Sunday school? Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. One of them is, oh, be careful little mouth what you say. Hey, Jerry and I used to say that before every ball game in the church league. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Words, words. Job said that at the end of, after all his complaining and griping with his buddies and, and belly aching to the Lord. You know what he said in one of the last chapters there when he saw God and God spoke to him and said, where were you? when I set the perimeter for the ocean? Where were you when I raised up the mountains? Where were you when I created the earth? And when Job saw the glory of God, you know what he said? Shut my mouth. I said stuff that should have never come out. Boy. Um, and so often we have said and done things with our mouth that we wish. And so when you brush your teeth, Lord, <clears throat> guide me in what I say today. Guide my words. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, let my words be in line with yours. Say things that agree with God. For example, here's one obvious one. You know, one of the phrases that people said for years and years was this one, go to hell. Remember that phrase? And maybe you still hear it a lot. But here's what's wrong with that phrase. <laughs> Is God's will for anybody to go to hell? No. God's will is for everyone to be saved and go to heaven. So the phrase go to hell is opposite, contrary to the word of God. 
and the child of God should only be speaking words that agree with God. Speak words that agree with God. There was a man I listened to years ago by the name of Charles Capps, a pastor, I think in Arkansas, and he said this, as he was praying about things that were going on in his congregation, he said the Lord told him this, Charles, I have told my people in Mark 11, 23, that they can have what they say. Whosoever will say unto a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe the things that he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. I said, Charles, I've told my people they can have what they say, and yet they continually only say what they have. You get the difference? I have a cold. I have the flu. I have cancer. I have bills I can't pay. I have a bad memory. I have a bad... See, we, we claim stuff with our words. We claim ownership. Should we deny that we have cancer? No. My body has cancer. Should we deny that we're forgetful? No, my mind forgets things. But which things are more important? Spiritual things or earthly material things? Spiritual things. So if we're going to say, let the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, do you think God is more pleased with spiritual words that we speak or the material earthly words that we speak? See, God says people always say what they have in the natural. And God said, you can have what you say in the spirit realm. Begin to say and pray and speak words with your mouth that agree with God's word. So as you're brushing your teeth, Lord, let my words today be acceptable in thy sight. When you eat breakfast in the morning, Lord, I'm feeding my body. But Lord, I pray today that you'll feed me as I study my devotions, as I pray, as I meditate. Lord, feed me spiritually. As important as breakfast is, what's more important? Breakfast or spiritual revelation knowledge from the Word of God? We'll all agree it's the Word of God, but we spend more time feeding our face than we do feeding our spirit. We do wrong. Find time every day to meditate in the Word, to read the Word, pray the Word, uh, breakfast when you're feeding or lunchtime. Lord, feed me today from your Word. I miss those years I worked for my dad. I, I mentioned in Sunday school. I learned from more from my dad in the 28 years I worked beside him, talked with him, fellowshiped with him, had conversations with him more than once a day about spiritual things. I learned more from him than I did from any academic or Bible course that I ever took. Because our conversations, we'd talk about spiritual things, we'd meditate on them, we'd pray and ask for the Lord's guidance, and we learned and we grew together there. Another key area that, how many of you take medicine this morning? You remember to take your pills. Okay. Say, I grew up in Pentecost where they didn't say it, but I felt like they were saying. I felt like they were saying, if you're taking medicine, if you're going to the doctor, if you're depending on the doctor, it's because your faith is weak and you're not trusting God to meet all of your needs. And so there was kind of a condemnation. And after I got married, I would have headaches almost every morning when I woke up. And um, so I ended up finding out that the only thing that really helped with those headaches was Excedrin, which is 250 milligrams aspirin, 250 milligrams Tylenol or acetaminophen, and 65 grams of caffeine. caffeine. Most of you probably have coffee, but I got it in my Excedrin. Caffeine! And, but when I, I found that those pills helped, but almost every morning when I took those pills, I, I condemned myself because I was depending on the Excedrin for relief and more so than the Lord. And finally, I went to a, an evangelist that I respected, a man that I, Don Cox, that I had grown up with and televangelist, pastor. And uh, so I asked him, and I told him I was feeling guilty about taking this medicine. And he said, well, let me ask you this question, Jim. Do you think the wisdom and knowledge about medicine and, and uh, uh, 
the medical sciences, do you think that knowledge came from God or the devil? I said, well, Don, I never thought of it. Nobody ever asked me that, but my first thought would be it came from God because you don't get it from the tribes in Africa. That's voodoo stuff. And you don't get it from the spiritism and in other cults. And primarily, the, advance, the major advances in medicine and medical science have come from Europe and the God-based nations. And so I guess I would say it comes from God. And he said, exactly. In fact, the Bible says, a merry heart does you good like a... Medicine. Medicine in Proverbs. In other words, the translation of that, a merry heart does you good, just like medicine does you good. There's a scripture right there. If Satan's telling you, oh, you're not trusting God, you're going to the doctor, you're depending on your pills, a merry heart does you good, just like a medicine does you good. And there's a lot of references in the Bible, the balm in Gilead and the healing and, and, and so on, uh, different scriptures about um, the medical things in the Bible. But here's his ultimate example. Jim, have you ever watched a train go down the tracks? Yeah. You know how many rails it takes for a train to go successfully to its journey? Uh, yeah, trains run on two rails. He said, uh, uh, how far apart are they? I said, oh, about like that. He says, uh, do they ever meet? I said, no, uh, you'd be in trouble if, if these two rails got narrower and, and cross paths, you'd be in trouble. He said, no, they run parallel. They're both headed in the same direction. And the goal is the same for both rails to get to the destination. And for a spiritual application, God's goal is health for your body. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health as your soul prospers. He wants you to be healthy. So there's these two rails God has created. Prayers, Jesus healed the sick, he laid the hands on them, he prayed the prayer of faith and they were healed. There was others he sent to the doctor, and these are two rails that God intends for us to have health in our bodies. Believing, trusting in God, medical science. They're different, they don't meet, but they're both headed in the same direction. And so he said, here's what my advice would be. Instead of condemning yourself for taking your pills in the morning, pray over them. You got them in your hand, say, Lord, I ask you to bless these pills. Let them accomplish and, and perform in my body the thing that they're designed to do and grant me health and strength this day. I believe it in Jesus' name. Trust in the Lord, even when you're taking your pills. Uh, I'm obviously not going to get to all of these, but how many of you wore shoes this morning? You got them on? Yeah. Why? Uh, well, because if I was walking across on these rocks out here barefoot, it'd be ooh, ooh, ow, ow, ow. Um, they're for protecting our feet. So when you put your shoes on, say, Lord, thank you for directing my path. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. Thank you, Lord, for that strength in my life. Thank you for guiding me. How many of you have pictures on your refrigerators of kids and grandkids, you know, or favorite cartoons or whatever? Everybody, one of the first things we do in the morning is go to the refrigerator. So when you go to the refrigerator, we all do that. And we've got these pictures there. And we put pictures of our kids, grandkids, or great-grandkids there for a reason. And let it be to remind you. Emma McKinley said she did this for 18 years. Her kitchen door was plastered with pictures of all the people in her life, family, friends from the Mayo Clinic, nurses, staff, and she had a whole door, dozens of pictures. And she would, said she would go out there in her wheelchair every morning, Lord, I pray for Dr. Bob. Lord, I pray for my son. Lord, I pray for my grandson. Lord, I pray for the... I, and she went through and she prayed for each one of those people on her door every morning. Now, for some of us, that'd take quite a while. The Lord told my mom that years ago. I was the oldest of six, six. And, and she said, Lord, I, I'm worried, I'm concerned about raising all these six kids to know the Lord. And here's what the Lord told my mom. Mary, you pray for each one of your kids every day. You put them into my hands and I'll take care of them. Do that with your family. Cast your care upon him. Roll it over on him. Pray for your kids, pray for your family, pray for those that you love in your life. 
Look at those kids on the refrigerator and pray for them. Pray for them. Use these little things as reminders in your life. Um, we take a drink. There was a woman at the well. Jesus went and talked to her, and and he said, "Get me a drink." And she goes, "Well, how come you're a Jew and you speak to me? I'm a, a sinner. I'm uh, most people won't even speak to me." And Jesus said, if you knew the water that I would had, you'd be asking me for a drink. What? Sir, you don't even have a, a rope or a bucket. What are you talking about? She said, I'm talking about living water. The water that I give will spring up to eternal life. So the next time you take a drink, say, Lord, I thank you for living water that flows through me. Thank you for eternal life. You can use all of these things. I've got a whole list of them here. I'm not going to have time to go through each one. But when you spend money... Uh, we go shopping, we spend money for all kinds of things. Lord, I thank you for supplying all of my need. Uh, how many of you are still eating candy? Uh, Lord, I thank you for your goodness, your sweetness, all these sweet, tender mercies that you put in my life. Uh, lunchtime, Lord, I thank you for the promise that one day I'm going to eat at your table. I'm going to eat at your table. Jesus told the disciples, at the Last Supper, I will not eat this bread or drink this cup again till we eat together at that communion table in heaven. We're going to eat with the Lord. So thank him for that. You walk out and you see nature. You saw robins or the red-winged blackbirds. Lord, thank you for this awesome nature. Thank you. I see this eagle flying here on the wall. Uh, I, I see him down here majestically flying over the river and... Uh, down on County K, Union Road, that pond up, there's this eagle gliding over, looking for his prey. God has done some wonderful things in nature. Thank him. Here we are at church. Lord, I thank you for the fellowship that we have. First John, truly our fellowship is with God the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ, and with one another. It's, it's an amazing what we have, so thank God for that. Then when you get ready for bed at night, just before you climb into bed, say, Lord, I thank you for these times of refreshing. You know, Hebrews talks about there remaineth a rest for the children of God. There's a place of rest, peace and trust in him. Lord, I thank you for that rest. I thank you for this refreshing that you give not only to my body, but my soul, my spirit, my mind. Let me be at peace this night as I rest in you. Then when you pull up a blanket, I don't, maybe you don't do it anymore. How many have a favorite blanket? I bought Linda um, an Eddie Bauer Super Soft Comforter years ago. And I'll look over there, especially in the winter nights, and she's got that wrapped up around her, and, and she's just all comfy in that blanket. And at night, say, Lord, I thank you for the comfort that I get from fellowshipping with you, the peace that you give me. See, so you can pray without ceasing. You can pray every morning, noontime, nighttime. Pray without ceasing. All of these little things. And I think that's more pleasing to God. You know, we sing a song, there's a wonderful one, Sweet Hour of Prayer. But how many of you have trouble spending one hour in prayer without your mind wandering off in the first three minutes? We do. It, it just wanders here and there and... and it takes a great discipline, um, but we can pray all day long, little bits here and there all the way down. So here's a scripture Moses told Joshua, meditate in these things day and night, do these things and you'll prosper and you have good success. Do this. Here, talk to the Lord all day long. Just talk to him. Have this little bit of fellowship. Let this be a year of meditation, prayer, fellowship with the Lord. I believe we all be a lot better off. Um, spend time in communication with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the incredible privilege that we have. Not only to have a right relationship with the Father to be restored back to that place because of our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But we have the privilege, the 
honored to communicate and fellowship. We have an audience with the creator of the universe. We have intimate communion and fellowship with the King of Kings, the great I am. Lord, so help us to take advantage of that. Not just on Sundays, not just once a day, over and over again, all day long, prayer without ceasing to magnify and lift up your name in all these little ways. Lord, I thank you for it. And I pray that this lesson will be an encouragement and help to each one that's heard it. Lord, let us use these little cards to remind us to acknowledge you in all of our ways, every step, decision that we make because you're there to direct our paths. I claim that, we receive it, we ask for it, and agree together in Jesus' name, saying, Amen. God bless you. Thank you all for coming and sharing this day with us.